good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship here at St. James in Kempville. It's a pleasure to have you joining us this morning. It is a beautiful, although very cold, I think it's negative 23 out with the wind chill. It's uh, just nonsense cold out. Uh, just want to bring your attention to these beautiful uh, irises and tulips uh, that are placed here in the church to the glory of God and also in memory of Richard McLean. Uh, the funeral for Richard takes place this coming Tuesday at 11 o'clock at the Pentecostal Church here in Kempville. And if you would like to attend that service, if you head over to Hall's Playfair and McGarry's uh, funeral home uh, page, and you can click on Richard's service there, and there's a link to register. Uh, you are most welcome to come. I think this registration is open um, to about 100 people, 50% capacity. Well... Let us continue now as we worship our opening hymn, Angels from the Realms of Glory. Jesus manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I invite you to say the inventory hymn with me. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there is no water, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips my mouth will praise you. On my bed I remember you. I think of you through the night watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. And I invite you, you're probably already seated. Here's the reading of God's word. A reading from the prophet Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, 
Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a youth, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. And I invite you to say the psalm responsibly with me by verse. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, rescue me and deliver me. Turn your ear to me and save me. Be my rock of refuge, to which I can always go. Give the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Deliver me. For you have been my hope, Sovereign Lord, my confidence since my youth. From birth I have relied on you. You brought me forth from my mother's womb. I will ever praise you. I invite you to stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at his gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself, and you will say, Do you hear also in your hometown? the things that we have heard that you have done in Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in a prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow of Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, led him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed by them through the midst and went on his way. The Gospel of Christ. Praise Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And I invite you to be seated. Father, we give you thanks for a beautiful winter day. Thank you for the sun rising this morning, the beautiful sunrise. Thank you for the birds that sing in the trees, for your creation which reveals to us your general grace. And thank you for your son, Jesus, who reveals to us specific grace, the grace of our salvation. Lord, we pray now as we look at your word that you would speak to our hearts and remind us of your character and draw us more deeply into the mystery that is your divine love. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. When the Romans came to conquer Israel, 
uh, all of their fortified cities, including Jerusalem, fell. And there was one that remained, one lone fortification hidden on the top of a plateau down in the desert by the Dead Sea. The impenetrable fortress is called the Meseda. It is built on top of a plateau of a mountain uh, so that the uh, fortress takes up the entire top of the mountain. There's only one way to get in to Meseda, and that is to use the footpath that crisscrosses all over, over the surface of the mountain up to the only uh, gate. It is uh, and was used for decades by various people. Uh, around the time of Christ, though, it was used by uh, King Herod, who had it, uh, its fortifications increased and had some luxuries installed, including a bath. It was impenetrable. No one could get in, and it was easily defended. Inside the city, uh, of course, they had this huge network that would collect rainwater into a gigantic cistern. The cistern could hold enough water for all of the inhabitants for years and years and years. The storage of food, of crops, meant that even under a siege that lasted years, the fortress would not have to surrender. It was considered impenetrable. When the Romans arrived, they tried all of their normal tactics, the bribing of people inside the walls and all of the other sorts of things that they do and had worked in other places, and none of it worked. And so they realized the only way to get in to this fortress was to begin the monumental task of filling in the valley between the plateau of the fortress and the nearest plateau. This huge valley. And so with buckets and shovels, the Roman military began to fill in that valley. And though it took months and even years to fill it in, they did and eventually breached the wall of that fortress. This uh, fortress is not only, uh, and the story is a beautiful story about what took place there, but it's not only a, a wonderful image and a, and a historical place, but it also occupies the imagination of the Israeli people. Uh, to this day, when uh, soldiers uh, enter into the military and you have to do, um, you're required to do years, two years of military service if you live there, um, so essentially everybody goes to the military, you go to Meseda, you do a pilgrimage uh, in the night uh, to the fortress um, in order to be initiated into the military. And you are to swear these words, Masada will not fall again. This fortress has a deep history and it also is part of the cultural understanding of who the Israeli people are, a people who refuse to surrender their freedom. When we think of fortresses, we might think of this one uh, that existed at the time of Christ. We also might think of beautiful fortresses that are spread throughout Europe in the Middle East, places of refuge, towers and very strong walls and gates and bars and, and moats, garrisons, all of these things. Places that people would run into for sanctuary when the enemy attacked. Castles also, uh, because of their presence, provided stability in their region, not only because they were permanent and they could, uh, people could gather there to be protected, but also they were offensive. And so, under the uh, sort of shadow of the castle was this economy that grew up of settlements, of people living there, uh, it became an economic center, an administrative center, and a cultural center. So the castle not only provided protection, but also offense, and also uh, stability, so there was economic prosperity and abundance. In some castles, the parish church was located within the walls, so that the castle itself provided spiritual nourishment to the people of its land. When the psalmist talks of God as a strong fortress, these are some of the images that might come up in our minds. Certainly for the psalmist, the image of Masada perhaps would be most prominent. He talks of a place that we can run into to seek refuge, a place of safety, of security. He speaks here of our Lord, our Father, of running into his arms, a place to be embraced, cherished, 
to be known and to be loved. It is a place where we go knowing that we do not need to worry about the enemy, though we may be pursued. It is a place where we know that the things of this world cannot get to us, that the things of our flesh do not have purchase, and the evil intentions of the enemy cannot enter. In God our Father, we are secure not because we are strong or we gain strength for being with him, but rather in God we are strong because he is the impenetrable fortress. He is immovable. He is the rock. The world, the flesh, the enemy launch flaming arrows against his walls and they fall. They hurl insults and guilt and try to attach them to us and they are repelled. And When we take self-loathing or shame with us, it is extracted. Bitterness and pain are turned into forgiveness and compassion in his presence. Nothing in our lives is outside of his foreknowledge. Nothing surprises him. He knows everything that is going to take place in your day today. And in that, he is a refuge for you. Castles in their permanence provided this abundance for those who gathered around them. In that same vein, God provides abundance for us. Not of the cheap things of this world, of gold or silver, but of the truly valuable things, the valuable things of God. It is an abundant life. That is a life that is transformed by Him, that is growing in holiness, a life that is steeped in forgiveness and self-giving, that is open to joy and hope, and to his peace, which is beyond our understanding. In God, our fortress, abundant life is made to flourish. When you think of God as an impenetrable for- fortress, um, nothing can get over his walls. Nothing can undermine the walls. Nothing can breach the walls. The walls are so, uh, so strong that nothing gets in, not even death itself, can get past these fortifications. They are immovable. Unlike the fortresses of our world, and there's lots of them, you can look them up on the internet. I did uh, look at the strongest fortresses in the world. It's fascinating to see their history. Uh, many of them uh, have been taken. The fortresses of this world, of course, are built with human hands and various technologies but with the sweat and physical labor. And they are open and susceptible to the extremes of weather. God's fortress, there is not one stone that is out of place. The wind, the freezing, the rain, none of it even touches his structure. He is immovable. And God's fortress, unlike ours that are temporary, his fortress is eternal. It existed before all things, and it will exist after all things no longer exist. The strongest fortresses, even Maseda, were built to last several years of siege. God's fortress, built to outlast the world, the flesh, and the enemy, Not for years, but for eternity. God's fortress built to outlast death itself by the blood of Christ. God's fortress is eternal. And the gates of that fortress are open. And all are welcomed there. He welcomes all of those who call on his name. 
And he does not welcome us as strangers that he hopes will become friends. He welcomes us as children, as family, those he knows and loves, calls us by our first name with a voice that shares with us our inherent value in him. And here in the fortress of God, we discover that we are not new to him. We discover indeed that he created us, that he formed us in our mother's womb. And as Jeremiah says, that he knew us before we had form. God welcomes us as family because he's known us since the beginning of our existence. And he will know us at the end of our existence here on earth and into eternity where we dwell with him. Martin Luther, the original Martin Luther, uh, had, there was a particular year in his life uh, that was very challenging. He had uh, undergone 10 years of political and theological persecution. His life had been threatened numerous times. He was suffering from severe depression. At one point in that year, he uh, had to stop in the middle of a sermon because he was so dizzy. In that year, he wrote his most famous hymn, which is, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And I want to read you a couple of verses from this, remembering where Martin Luther was in his life, the most challenging year that he had ever endured. He says this, And though this world, with devils filled, should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not of him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. That spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Followers of Christ, God is our fortress. He is our refuge. He is our home. He is the place that we can run to for protection and provision and dwell with not only in this life, but in the next. But we must choose to go to him. He will not force our hand, but he always invites. Let us be a people who trust in God, a people who find hope in our Lord, and a people who are able to sleep soundly, knowing we are in the fortress of our God. Amen. Let us confess our faith as we say. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to kneel or sit as you are able for our prayers. Let us pray. At the end of each petition, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and I invite your response of, hear our prayer. Father, grant to your faithful people pardon and your peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind and pure heart. Lord, in your mercy, hear hear our our prayer. prayer. Father, in a world where many are lonely, we thank you for our friendships. In a world where many are captive, we thank you for our freedom. In a world where many are hungry, we thank you for our provision. Father, we pray that you will deepen our compassion and give us grateful and thankful hearts to serve and love one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear hear our prayer. Father, we pray for those who are hungry and in want of food, clothing, and shelter, especially in these cold temperatures, not only in the far reaches of our globe, but right in our own backyard, in our own community. Show us what we can do to help those who have so little and bless the efforts of those who work to overcome poverty and hunger that sufficient food, clothing, and shelter may be found for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear hear our our prayer. prayer. Lord, you prayed that your disciples may be one, even as you are one with the Father. Draw us closer to yourself, that in common love and obedience to you, we may be united to one another in faith, one in baptism, one in the Lord, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear Hear our our prayer. God of all grace, call to the nations of the earth to cease from war and strife, that people may not fight one another, but contend with their common enemies of want, ignorance, disease, and sin. Lead us out of the way of harm and death into the way of life, life eternal in you. And from destruction and uprooting to the building and planting of a world that is filled with your righteousness and peace, your liberty and joy. Lord, in your mercy, hear Hear our our prayer. prayer. Father, we pray for the nation of Canada Guide us into the path of peace and wisdom, that in your light we may see the truth. Cause all our elected officials in all levels of government to walk before you in truth and righteousness, in integrity of humility and honor, as they fulfill their office to the glory, to your glory, and to the public good of all people. Father, may your love, may your peace, may your truth rule and reign over our nation to make it strong and free. Lord, in your mercy, hear Hear our our prayer. prayer. Father, we pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, and lay ministers, especially Bishop Michael, Reverend Andrew, and Reverend Robert. But by the gift of your grace, all in your various appointments may faithfully serve you and have the strength to be firm witnesses of the gospel to the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, sustainer of life and source of our hope and comfort, relieve all within our communities and our congregations who endure illnesses, loneliness, and persistent disabilities. We especially ask your grace and healing touch upon these, our friends, who are in need of our prayers. I invite you also now to place before our Lord those who are on your hearts. We pray for Avalon, Hal, 
Verna. We pray for Grenville, George, and Harold. India, Jim, and Keith. We pray for Heather, Dwayne, and Alan. We pray for Connor, Debbie, and Patrick. We pray for Linda, Ken, and Ruth. We pray for Michelle, Neil, and Helena. We pray for Edith, Margaret, Mary. We pray for David, Kate, and Isla. We pray for Anne, Thomas, and Stephanie. And we pray for Jock. And Lord, we pray for all those who mourn at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Father, thank you that you are a good father and a fortress to all who seek you, who sees and knows our needs before we even realize we need them. Help us keep our eyes focused on your kingdom, or your provision, your reality, and your promises of our everyday concerns are and will be met beyond our thoughts and our expectations. Help us keep our entire attention on what you are presently doing in our lives and not get worked up about the stability of the future, of what may or may not, or may not happen. Help us not to be so preoccupied and blinded with getting so we cannot pursue, perceive, and respond to your giving out of the goodness of your love and mercy. Help us center our eyes on the cross from which every good and perfect gift flows. May our lives be filled with your presence as you open the doors of our hearts to the reality of your nearness and your love. Amen. In the prayer for today. Living God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace, and in the renewal of our lives make known your glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to pray the Lord's Prayer with me. As Christ our Savior has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And our closing hymn, Joy Has Dawned.
thank you for being here to worship with us. The diocese plans to open on March the 2nd, which is uh, the it's Ash, Ash Wednesday, uh, the first uh, Wednesday in March. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. God bless your week.